World Wars, and the Demise of the British Empire. The program taped at Mr. Buchanan's home is an hour. Pat Buchanan, how would you describe Winston Churchill? Winston Churchill was a great man, one of the greatest of the century, uh, a man of extraordinary accomplishments and extraordinary capacities and abilities, but of an incurably flawed judgment. And I think Winston Churchill, for all his triumphs and successes, was probably the man most responsible for the early and rapid collapse of the British Empire. I think some of his judgments were colossally wrong, some of them were right, and I do believe he's probably the one of the most extraordinary men who ever lived. Expand on why you think he is responsible for the collapse of the British Empire. I think what brought the British Empire down as rapidly as it did and <clears throat> as terribly as it did was World War II. In my judgment, World War II was exactly what Churchill called it, the unnecessary war. And the fatal blunder, as I describe it in my book, was the decision in panic of the British government after Czechoslovakia fell apart in 1939, March, to give an unsolicited war guarantee to a collection of Polish colonels who had a romantic view of their own warlike capacities, who had participated in the breakup of Czechoslovakia. And Britain gave this war guarantee unsolicited to back the Poles in a cause, control of Danzig, where they thought the Germans were fundamentally right. And that war guarantee, which stiffened the Polish spine, gave the Poles the backbone to stand up to Hitler, who now had no way out but to take Danzig. Hitler attacked Poland. The British declared war on Germany. That six-year war brought down the British Empire. And the man who was driving hardest for war with Germany was Winston Churchill. How would you describe Adolf Hitler? Hitler is, a, uh, is clearly a satanic figure uh, in, in terms of what he did, and an evil man, an amoral man, uh, a Darwinian, uh, who called himself a barbarian. But Hitler, as a statesman, his objectives and, 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 and foreign policy and geostrategic policy was in some ways more conservative, less ambitious than that of the Kaiser. Hitler had been in World War II, excuse me, World War I. He had fought for four years, and he had come out of that war with these lessons learned. One was, we made a fatal mistake going to a true front war with Russia and the Atlantic powers. The Americans and the British, as soon as we went to war with them, because they're great sea powers, they cut off all our colonies our colonies were hostages. We lost them all instantly. We can't defeat the British and the Americans. Secondly, the British are our natural ally. Even in Mein Kampf, he says, the British, they're a commercial power and a world power with all their colonies. We have no quarrel with the British. And therefore, they and the Italians are our natural allies. And to keep him, the British, friendly or neutral or allied meant that Hitler had to give up any ambitions to take back Alsace-Lorraine or the small territories he had lost to Belgium or Denmark. He wrote those off, and he wrote off the South Tyrol to Italy because he wanted an ally in Italy. What he wanted was peace or indifference in the West and to create around himself a number of basically satellite allied nations that would make Germany the dominant power in Central and Eastern Europe. And if there was one nation he wanted to go after and destroy. It was the Bolshevik regime in the Soviet Union. And in fact, in your book, you quote Mein Kampf saying that he wanted to go east and not He west. wanted to go east, and he made this decision. Other historians of Kirchhoff says the same thing, who wrote the last two very good books on Hitler and his ambitions, was that, that Hitler's ambitions uh, were in the east and maybe only, some believe, only in the east. My view is I'm not even sure Hitler wanted a war with the Soviet Union. Clearly, as I demonstrate in the book from Hitler's own statesman, statements, he wanted the Polish Danzig question in the corridor settled not by force, he told his generals and diplomats. And that's understandable given what he demanded. What did he demand? A Nazi flag over a German flag over Danzig, a city of a town of 350,000, 
political control for the Germans, let the Poles keep economic control. He didn't demand the Polish corridor back, and if he wanted war with Poland, that's what he would have demanded. He demanded a, a quarter mile rail and road corridor across the Polish corridor between Prussia and Germany, which had been separated foolishly at Versailles by giving Poland this strip of German land between them. He never wanted war with Britain, and he never wanted a world war. But September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. He invaded Poland because... Militarily. Militarily, because why did he invade Poland? On the 26th of March, he said, I don't want this issue settled by force with Poland. Why? He wanted Poland as an ally. He had an agreement with Pilsudski, who died in 1935. He liked Pilsudski. These people were right-wing neo-fascists. And, and Hitler liked the regime. And what he wanted from the regime, he thought the regime was a natural ally, just like Mussolini, just like Admiral Horthy, just like General Franco, just like the, uh, the, uh, the Monsignor Tiso in Slovakia. These were right-wingers he thought are natural allies. And in return for giving him Danzig back and a rail and road carter, he wanted them in the anti common turn pack that he was pulling together of Germany, Italy, Japan against Moscow, the Soviet Union, Judeo Bolshevism, as he called it. And so that's what he wanted. But when the Brits gave the war guarantee on the 31st, Hitler went berserk. In two days, he ordered Case White, and that is preparations for an invasion of Poland as of September 1. Uh, at the latest. But then he kept making offers to Poland. He still wanted to deal with the Poles. He didn't want war. And then the British, of course, and the French are in Moscow trying to cut a deal with Stalin. And so Hitler's watching this. So, and the Poles refuse even to talk to him about Danzig. And Henderson, the British ambassador, says, why wasn't I told of the generosity of Hitler's offer of April 25th? So Hitler is increasingly frustrated. He's going to be forced to back down. So he says, the West is, the West, the Poles have joined the West against me. So he forms an alliance with Stalin. Even that, I think, was not designed necessarily for war. It was designed diplomatically to get the Brits out. And what he did, that was on the 23rd or 24th of August. And so Neville Chamberlain is still prime minister. So Chamberlain, what does he do? When Hitler announces this Hitler-Stalin pact, Hitler thinks that this brilliant pact, we got the Soviets on our side and we're there, and clearly Poland's going to be divided again and the Brits can't do anything about it, they're not going to stand up behind their guarantee. The 24th, Chamberlain reissues the guarantee to Poland and forms a military alliance with Poland. What did Hitler do? He backed down. He called off the invasion for the 25th. And he tried to find a way all during that week, that period, to give, get some kind of deal with the Poles, which would at least, or some kind of offer to the Poles, which would convince the British to say, look, Poland, you've got to deal with Germany or we're not going to stand by the guarantee. So ultimately, when you see Hitler in his own interpreter, when the British uh, hand the ultimatum in and Henderson takes it into Ribbentrop, who takes it into Hitler, Hitler is, uh, they just say his face was a mask of rage. He looked at Ribbentrop and he said, what now? And what he meant, I think, was our diplomacy has failed because he never, never wanted war with the British Empire. He, of all the leaders, take FDR, Churchill, Stalin, Mussolini, all the others, of all the leaders, Hitler was a greater admirer of the British Empire than any of them except Winston Churchill. Pat Buchanan, are you suggesting that Poland should have been sacrificed to prevent World War II? No, I'm not suggesting Poland should have been sacrificed. What I am saying is, as of 1930, first, the Polish corridor and Danzig were not worth a war by Great Britain. Secondly, Great Britain could not defend the corridor and Danzig. Third, they had no plans to defend Danzig and the corridor. Fourth, they thought the Germans were right on the issue. What I'm saying is they should never have issued the war guarantee to Poland. They should have told the Poles the truth. We can't defend you, and there's no way we can defeat Germany in the amount of time it's going to take them to defeat you. You've got to decide this yourselves. What the British should have done and the French after the collapse of Czechoslovakia is exactly what I wrote in a book, Republic, Not an Empire, and George Kennan agreed with me. And what it is is draw a line across the low countries 
and across the front of France, a red line, and tell Hitler if he crosses it, he's at war with Great Britain and France. Hitler would never have crossed the line. That is what the Americans did. When Stalin had control of all of Eastern Europe, we didn't say you've got to get out of Poland or if you move into Hungary as they did in 56, you're at war. We said if you cross the Elbe River, you're at war with NATO and the United States and Stalin didn't cross it. That is what I'm saying, that Hitler didn't want war with Poland, he didn't want war with Britain, and had there been no guarantee, no war guarantee, there would have been no war in the West in my judgment. And frankly, all the people, all the Jewish people and Christian people of Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Luxembourg, Holland, France, Italy, Yugoslavia, Greece, would have survived the war. There would have been no war in the West. That's what I believe. When did Winston Churchill become prime minister? He became prime minister in the uh, 10th of May, 1940. Uh, and he became prime minister as a result of the Norvik debacle, the Norway debacle, where the first Lord of the Admiralty, who happened to be Winston Churchill, plotted a British move into neutral Norway to violate their neutrality, to seize the Norwegian ports, which were being used by the Germans, who were transshipping iron ore from Sweden th through Norway and down the coast because the Swedish ports were frozen in the winter. Churchill had this plan to violate the neutrality of Norway. But he foolishly leaked it to some military aides, and it got word got to Hitler. Hitler wanted to keep Norway neutral. It was just what he wanted, because he had a great benefit, Norway and Denmark. So Hitler said, in effect, the British are going to move in there, and we've got to move first. And so Admiral Raider and his troops, some of whom were planted in the uh, holds of merchant ships, they were all moved into Norway. And they took it a day before the British Marines arrived. And they took all the ports. And this debacle, Lord Lloyd George called it one of a series of debacles, which was Churchill's responsibility, caused the collapse of Chamberlain's government. And who rose to power? <laughs> Winston Churchill, the architect of the disaster. Uh, it is an amazing story. I mean, the man did have great luck. It, it, but weren't the British invited by the King of Norway? No, the British were planning an invasion. of New Norway was neutral. The British were planning to move into it directly and violate its neutrality. This is what is so funny about, not funny, but it's so uh, paradoxical about World War I. You know, Churchill persuaded Lloyd George, or helped persuade him. I think Lloyd George was going to stay with the war party anyhow, because he was an opportunist and he knew if he went against it, he'd be out. But Churchill persuaded Lloyd George, said, stay with us until, uh, until we find out how the Germans come through into France in World War I. This is April, I mean, August 19, uh, Guns of August 19, uh, 1914, because Churchill knew that the, the German army had to come through Belgium. And so, and that Churchill and the others, the horrible thing they've done, violated the neutrality of Belgium. Churchill was planning to violate the neutrality of Belgium himself by blockading Belgian ports if the Germans hadn't violated it first. Well, in your new book, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War, How Britain Lost Its Empire and the West Lost the World, well, in your new book, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War, How Britain Lost Its Empire and the West Lost the World, you trace the origins of World War II back to World War I and prior to World War I, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily new information. But right. Germany invaded Belgium, Belgium first. Oh, yeah, there's no before, question. Before any... Oh, I don't deny that. Germany violated Belgian neutrality. And look, Germany made enormous blunders in And this World is back War in 19, 1913, 1914. I don't exonerate the Germans of all responsibility. And even at Versailles, they said, we do not say we are not partly responsible for this war, but we do not bear full moral culpability for it. The great blunder of the Germans was to give the Kaiser a war guarantee. This is one of the keys to my book, a blank check to Austria to punish the Serbs who had assassinated their archduke. And the Austrians were right. The uh, assassination of the Archduke was by a fanatic, but he had ties to Serbian intelligence, clearly ties to the top of Serbian intelligence. And the Austrians took the blank check and held it for four weeks before they issued the ultimatum to Serbia. If they had moved right away, all of Europe would have understood, but they held it for four weeks until the Russians 
got into the idea that, that this is the, they're moving on Serbia, our little brothers, our allies. And the Kaiser, at the end of this process, in, in late August, excuse me, in late July, he was desperate to try to pull it back. So was the Tsar, so was King George V. Uh, so, quite frankly, was, uh, were all the monarchs of Europe, Franz Joseph, were trying to pull back, but they were very hard men in every camp. And the hardest of them all in England was Winston Spencer Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, Sir Edward Grey had committed Britain secretly to war for France uh, in any event, even if the Germans had not gone through Belgium. But the one who was really just disconsolate when he thought Sir Edward Grey might pull together a meeting of ambassadors and avert war was Winston Churchill. Okay. You've mentioned a couple names here. Who is David Lloyd George? Lloyd George is, uh, is probably, uh, certainly he's one of the two greatest prime ministers of the uh, 20th century. He, is the, he was the chancellor of the exchequer uh, and the putative or successor to Asquith, who was prime minister in 1914. And Lloyd George is an incredible character. In the Boer War, he had been an anti-war liberal, and he had been crucified for it. And his party had taken a terrible beating. Uh, but he was a great hero. He was an extraordinarily talented man. He's almost not, he's not up to Churchill's level in terms of Churchill as a writer. But as a politician, he was in many ways superior. Uh, he could bring people together and in the middle of World War I, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Asquith government fell, and he came into power in 1916 and formed a coalition government with the Tories, and he led the British to victory in World War I. Uh, he was represented the British Empire at the Versailles Conference, and objective observers said he was, even Lloyd Keane said, Lloyd George was head and shoulders above any of the other allied leaders, basically Clemenceau and Wilson and Orlando. And he came home for, from Versailles, the big winner. Uh, the, the, all the German ships were given to him, even though they committed suicide at Scapa Flow. He had the German merchant fleet. He had the underseas cables. He had new colonies in Africa. He had the parts of the Ottoman Empire. He had parts of the, uh, of the, Ottom of the British Empire, excuse me, the German Empire in the South Pacific. Uh, he had all these reparations. Uh, he made the Germans pay reparations for pensions uh, of the British soldiers because Great Britain had been unharmed. And so the French would have gotten all the reparations because it was torn to pieces northwest. And so he said, no, we've got to include pensions in there. And Wilson, to convince Wilson, who hated him, Wilson just hated Lloyd George. Lloyd George got Smuts, the ambassador of South Africa, or the, not the ambassador, the John uh, prime minister, John Smuts. And he, got a, he went and convinced Wilson. And so Wilson signed on to the pensions, and the Americans, who were very honorable at that conference and idealistic, who wanted an honorable peace, oh, they were sickened and enraged with, uh, with Woodrow Wilson. Sickened and enraged. Self-determination. Uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson's <laughs> self-determination, you talk you know, about that. You uh, know, Wilson got into the war after he won the election in 1916. His party ran on the platform, he kept us out of war. Uh, and what happened was, again, this is, again, no one's trying to exonerate the Kaiser and the German general staff of, of responsibility, their responsibility for the war. What the Kaiser had done was the Germans, and again, Churchill, had, had imposed a starvation blockade on Germany, a high seas blockade rather than a close in blockade. These were violations of international norms of conduct and warfare. You didn't starve women and children. Lloyd, Lord Salisbury said, we're not going to do that to the Boers. If the food's gone to the women and children and families, we've got to let it go through. We'll stop it if it's gone to their army. But Churchill imposed the starvation blockade on Germany, so the Germans retaliated with submarines. But the submarines sank the Lusitania off the Irish coast in April 1915. And there's a lot of conspiracy theories about what Churchill did that he put it in the way of the Germans. 128 Americans were killed, 1,000 people. And Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt and a lot of the Americans were demanding, get into the war. And I give Wilson credit. He stayed out of the war, but he did, they did warn the Germans. And so the Germans called off this unrestricted submarine warfare. But what happened, you're getting to 1917 now, and the German general staff meets with the Kaiser. Uh, and they met with him and said, look, 
the Americans, if we begin submarine warfare, the Americans are liable to come in, but the Americans are unarmed. They've got the 17th largest army in the world. They're sitting on the other side of the Atlantic. There's no more harm they can do to us than they're doing now. They're shipping all this stuff to the Brits. Give us six months with these submarines and we'll knock the Brits out of the war, they told the Kaiser. And uh, the Kaiser okayed it. And the German, uh, the German Prime Minister, uh, Bethmann Holweg, uh, he tried to convince otherwise, but he said, I can't argue with the generals and admirals. And as they all walked out of the room, he said, finis Germaniae, the end of Germany. And it, it ha that's what happened. The British held uh, the Germans, and they held them in the offensive of 1918, Ludendorff's final great offensive that reached the Marne. And the Americans, frankly, won the war. They, they were the decisive force. By the uh, spring and, and summer of 1918, 250,000 American troops a month were pouring into the lines. The German lines were breaking, their morale was down, the Austro-Hungarian Empire wanted out of the war, uh, and so that's when the Germans sued for peace. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the beginning of uh, a lot of the problems. See, the Germans had won the war against Russia, and they won the war against Ar uh, Romania, and they had imposed a peace on the, uh, Brit on the Russian Empire, on, on, uh, on Lenin's empire, which was in the interest of the West. They had torn Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, all these countries out of Lenin's empire and set them free. And so, and so to get back to the fundamental point, what I'm getting at is it was the, the, the Kaiser's ambitions were global. He had a world policy. He had a world fleet, the high seas fleet. He had colonies around the world. He wanted to be treated on a par with Great Britain. And one of the causes of the war was, of course, his his own mindset and the fact that the British treated him with such contempt. Sir Edward Grey, who is he? Sir Edward Grey is the foreign minister of Great Britain uh, for 10 years, who is probably the man most responsible for Britain's entry into World War I because it was he who told Haldane or approved Haldane's plan for military, secret military talks with France following up on their entente of 1904, which was designed to solve their, their uh, colonial quarrels. In Egypt, the French had claims on the canal, and in Morocco, the British had claims there. They traded them off, and that was to settle colonial quarrels. And Sir Edward Grey and Haldane uh, got together and said, let's start secret military talks to commit the British to send an army of 115,000 troops to France within two weeks of a war with Germany if it happens. This is almost 10 years before the war, 1905, January 1906. And frankly, it was the arrival of the British Expeditionary Force, the greatest little army in the world that stopped the German army on its big sweep through Belgium, which was going to come around and encircle the French. One German general, the German generals thought the British were firing machine guns. So effective were their riflemen from what they had learned in the Boer War. They could open and fire those guns perfectly 15 rounds a minute. And all of these soldiers, they were colonial soldiers, and it was a tiny army. But it was, I think, man for man at that point, the finest army in the world. And it stopped the German invasion of France. Pat Buchanan, you tell the story about July 1914, uh, a regatta, or a, a, a- This was June 1914. June 1914 in a regatta in Germany. Uh, sure. And it what was, happened then? Well, it was, what was wonderful about this was the Germans had, had challenged the British with a high seas fleet. They were building a great fleet in their keel in, in, in uh, Willemshaven. And this enormous fleet they were building was to rival the British fleet, and the Kaiser was responsible. And they kept building it up, building it up, and von Tirpitz was the architect of it. He came in in 1896 under the Kaiser. And they wanted to challenge the British fleet. And they said, in the event of war, we want to be able to do so much damage to them, the Brits won't fight us. And of course, this made the British understandably paranoid. They're, here's the, in the Baltic Sea, 400 miles away, is the greatest fleet on Earth besides their own. So they bring all these warships home from the rest of the world. And that's what brought the uh, Brits into alliance with Russia and France, who were their colonial rivals. So it was a stupid thing. But in 1913, Tirpitz gave it up. His rival over, incidentally, in was the first Lord of the Admiralty then, young Winston Churchill. And so the Germans were building dreadnought for dreadnought almost until they gave up. In 1913, Tirpitz said, we will accept 60% of the British Royal Navy. 
and we can't compete with the British and keep up our army and protect ourselves from the Russians who are building up in Poland, which was part of Russia then, and the French army, which is the finest in the world. So they stopped, and so the Kaiser was Queen Victoria's grandson. He regularly used to come over to England and race, and he won a race there, and his uncle, uh, Edward, uh, uh, Edward VII, uh, detested the Kaiser. W he was Willie. <laughs> <laughs> he had no respect for his nephew. And Willie came over and won a regatta over there. <laughs> and I think the Edward never again went to one of those regattas. But what they were having, and this is June, late June 1914. The British Navy sends over this mighty squadron with the George, King George V, their brand new battleships, Ajax, and all these dreadnoughts. They go into the harbor. The, the, the Tirpitz takes them aboard the finest German battleships. The Kaiser gets on his uniform of the British Admiralty, visits George V. They're having parties. Prince Henry brings the British officers in. They're meeting the girls. It's a wonderful time, and they're having their regatta. And a boat on the 28th or 29th, right around then, sails out a small boat to the Kaiser's ship. He's racing on his meteor. It's the name of his boat and says they've assassinated the Archduke, the Archduke Ferdinand, who was a great friend of the Kaiser's, and whom the Kaiser looked forward to seeing run the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Franz Joseph was probably 80s in his 80s. He had been in since 1848. And, uh, and so the Kaiser, everything appalled, went over it. And the British, uh, the British, of course, got on their warships, and the, the regatta was closed down, and the British, uh, and the Germans said, sent the signal, you know, a safe voyage home to England. And the British warship, I believe, sent back the signal, uh, friends, friends now, friends in future, friends forever. And these were the two greatest navies on earth. And that's the situation when the Archduke was assassinated. Six weeks later, the two countries are slaughtering each other in the fields of France. What Unbelievable, or six, eight weeks later. Friends now, friends in future, friends forever. And these were the two greatest navies on earth. And that's the situation when the Archduke was assassinated. Six weeks later, the two countries are slaughtering each other in the fields of France. What Unbelievable. Or six, eight weeks later. What was the Schlieffen plan? Uh, the Schlieffen plan was, uh, he's in one of the more interesting characters in history. Uh, Count von Schlieffen took over the German general staff in 1896. One of the previous leaders of it had been the great von Moltke, who believed, you know, they had trouble with France and Russia, that if war came, the, 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 French, the Germans should adopt a defensive posture and, let the, and, and defend what they had and let the enemy, they said, commit suicide on German steel. Von Schlieffen said the only way, the, what we, the strategic doctrine of the German general staff is this. Wherever a crisis occurs and war is imminent, we are going to be at war with both Russia and France. And the most powerful of our enemies and the most capable is the French army. The Russian army, while enormous, will take a long period of time. They don't have the railroads. And so what we have to do, no matter where the war begins, we have got to go through and kill France in six or eight weeks and kill the French army and then put the German army on trains to meet the Russian steamroller, which will be rolling into Prussia. And this was dogma, doctrine, in the German general staff. And they had all the timetables, all the horses, all the locomotives, where everybody reported. It was a gigantically enormous, complex plan. But to make it work, Schlieffen looked at the French forts at uh, Epinal, Verdun was one, Toul or others. These were tremendous French forts uh, that were just east of Alsace-Lorraine. And the Germans said, if we send our army in there, it'll be cut to pieces by these defensive positions. So how can we get into France? And the answer was Belgium. Belgium is neutral. So the Germans, Schlieffen said, we put one-fourth of our army, or one-seventh of our army, one-eighth of it down on Alsace-Lorraine, because the French will try to take back Alsace-Lorraine. Their army will sweep in in the south there. And what we want is a holding force to back up. Meantime, seven-eighths of our army will sweep through northern Belgium and will come around, because it'll be undefended, because Belgium's neutral, there's no French army there, come around behind Paris, behind the French army, and take them from the rear. And of course, the key here was this violated the neutrality of Belgium, which the 
Prussia, and in which France and all everybody had agreed to, 1939, was a vital interest of Britain. And each country had a right to protect it, had a right, not an obligation. So that was, that was the von Schlieffen plan. And so when all the troubles occurred in, uh, in, in Serbia and Austria, and the Austrians rejected Serbs who agreed to nine of their ten demands, the Austrians rejected it, sent an ultimatum, declared war. This is in late July. The Russians began to move to defend the Serbs and began to mobilize their entire army. The Kaiser said, for God's sakes, Nicky, to the Tsar, demobilize. The Tsar didn't do it. The German general staff put into effect the Schlieffen plan, and the trains began to roll. And, uh, and that set it off. As uh, one of the historians who's very good, he said, uh, von Schlieffen had, had died in uh, 1913, but he said the dead hand of Count von Schlieffen pulled the trigger that started the First World War. Uh, it's a remarkable story. Schlieffen is an unbelievable creature. Uh, he was driving, he was in a, a motor car or a carriage, and they were going across Belgium and these places before the war. He's, he's scouting it all out. And one of his officers said, my goodness, what a beautiful stream that is. And Schlieffen looked up and looked out and said, an insignificant obstacle, and moved right on. He was a, I mean, some of these figures in, in this history, German and British alike, are just extraordinary figures. And you understand, frankly, uh, how some of them, how they, I mean, they, see, they seem just in so much superior to some of the folks we run into these days. I mean, whether you agreed with them or liked them or disliked them, they're extraordinary men. The period <clears throat> between the wars, you talk about several of the treaties and Britain's attitude toward continental Europe. What are some of the treaties that, in your view, led to world, or, or the breaking of treaties that led to World War II, such as the uh, uh, Anglo-Japanese Treaty, the mm -hmm. rescission of that, the Locarno Treaty? Um, Locarno Pact, right. Lo Locarno Pact. How did that lead well, into World War II? Well, the, the, the seeds of World War II were planted at Versailles. Uh, when the Germans had surrendered on Wilson's 14 points, they said, we accept the 14 points, and it goes to your question, the right of self-determination. And so the Germans agreed that they were going to lose Alsace-Lorraine, that they're going to have to vacate Belgium. Uh, uh, that was in there, that the Poland needed a corridor to the sea. There would be an independent Poland. They had no problem with that. And so there's a number of things the Germans agreed to. But what happened is when they got to Versailles, the Germans weren't even invited to sit in. And they were handed this agreement, which basically tore Germany to pieces, tore the Austro-Hungarian Empire apart, not only that, but put uh, Austrian Germans under Italian rule uh, gave all these people got huge land grabs from it the British the French but they basically Hungary was torn to pieces it lost uh, its lands to the new Czechoslovakia but the key thing was what was done to Germany and not done in the West because I think the Germans accepted their losses in the West it what was done by first they put the Sudeten Germans or German Bohemian Bohemian Germans put three and a half million of them underneath Czech rule. They didn't give them any right of self-determination. They had no right to do that. They put the Slovaks under Czech rule, the Ruthenians under Czech rule. Uh, they put uh, 500,000 or 100,000 Poles and 800,000 Hungarians all under Czech rule and made it Czechoslovakia the 10th largest industrial nation in the world. They set the stage for a future crisis. They took Silesia, even the part that voted to stay with Germany, and gave that to Poland. And then they gave the city of Danzig to Poland, or rather to the, made it a free city under the League of Nations, but Polish control. Then Memel, the Lithuanians came in and stole the German city of Memel. And so what the Germans did, they were, they were divided, they were dismembered, they were placed, given unpayable debts, all their colonies, which they said would be equally, I mean, we will settle, have a fair settlement. They stole everything from their colonies. All the German private property homes were taken. Uh, the German rivers were internationalized. Uh, Germany was denied the right to free trade in other countries, but every country could sell into Germany. And it was just a, it was a humiliation and a disgrace and a dishonoring of what Wilson had promised and a dishonoring of all the things that had been promised in, in, the, in the peace negotiations at, at the beginning, at the end of the war. And, uh, and they declared the Kaiser a war criminal. And then they made the Germans sign total moral responsibility for everything that happened in the war and forced him to do that. And they said, if you don't sign the treaty, uh, we're going to, Marshal Foch will march to Berlin uh, with Americans and British and French troops, and the Czechs and the Poles will march in, 
and will continue the starvation blockade, which continued after the war, after the armistice. The Allies, with American ships participating, the Brits, continued to starve the German people, wouldn't let them fish in the Baltic Sea, till finally one courageous British general wrote at Paris, he said, look, my men, morale is being destroyed by watching little kids go through garbage and try to find food. And so we did this after they had laid down their arms. And so, uh, and so the Germans were completely embittered. And a thousand times Adolf Hitler gave a speech which was simply titled, The Treaty of Versailles. What about some of the treaties in the 20s and 30s? Well, this is the, now you go to the British end of it. That was, that was an act of, of criminal. Thank God you had the lodge in those people who did not sign the Treaty of Versailles and did not ratify it in the Senate because Americans would have been required to enforce this horribly unjust, dishonorable peace the Allies had imposed and Wilson had brought home. Thank God they kept us out of there. Now come the British blunders. The British start to get guilty feelings. But the first one was a result of guilty feelings. They're in debt to the Americans. So the Americans, um, Harding, Harding and, uh, Harding and uh, Heavens Hughes, the Secretary of State, they tell the British, look, uh, we're going to have a Washington Naval Conference and we want you to break your treaty with Japan. The British had a 20-year treaty with Japan. The Japanese had been completely loyal, had gobbled up all the German colonies in the Far East, had escorted British warships, British troops, Anzac troops to Gallipoli. And the Japanese had been loyal and faithful. The Americans says, give it up. And so the Brits had a huge battle over it. And uh, what happened was Billy Hughes, the Australian prime minister, said, we're going to have to Americans tell us what to do. We'll give up our treaty with Japan. If you sign a treaty with us, you Americans, to protect our colonies, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, all the rest, from the Japanese. Because if we, if we, if we insult and isolate Japan like that, we're going to make them an enemy. And the Americans offered them nothing. And the British, Churchill behind it, broke their treaty with Japan. Utter folly. That's the first blunder. And what was the result of that, though? Well, the result of that was the alienization and the isolation of Japan. What is Japan now? The Americans hate them. The Americans, they thought, were racist about the Japanese. They weren't entirely wrong. And they lost the British as an ally. They got nationalist uh, Chinese in China. China is rising. It is very anti-Japanese because of the Sino-Japanese War in the 1890s. And in Russia, they're facing this monstrous Bolshevik regime, uh, which is encroaching on China and Manchuria. And so the result of that was that the Japanese said, we've got to carve out an area in China as a, a, a defense, I mean, as a buffer state. And that's why the Japanese moved into Manchuria. They wanted to create a buffer state in China. And frankly, they now detested the West. And they also wanted to make the uh, China the way the British had India. You know, we dump all our products here and they produce for us. And that's our great colony. And so that's, and that is the reason the Japanese began to move in there. And if the British had not broken that alliance with the Japanese in 1931, when the Japanese moved into Manchuria, the British could have done what they did with the French. Okay, North China is your sphere of influence, South China is ours. The Japanese would have said fine. So the next thing you come to is, is the uh, Locarno Pact. The Locarno Pact was a, uh, an excellent pact. It was, a, uh, it was done by Austin Chamberlain, the half-brother of Joseph Chamberlain, but the Germans were behind it. Uh, the French were demanding that the Brits uh, give them a guarantee that they would come to war and defend them in case the Germans crossed the frontier. So the Germans came back and said, okay, that's a good idea, but give us a guarantee that if the Germans, if the French cross our frontier, you'll fight on our side. And so Italy, uh, Mussolini, and Britain gave the guarantee that the Rhineland would be permanently demilitarized, as it had been at Versailles, and secondly, that Britain and Italy would guarantee the frontier of the two countries, and the two countries signed it. And the Germans had a dem democratic regime at the time, and it was very pro-Western and a very anti-Bolshevik. 1935? This is 1925. 25. 25, 26. And Austin Chamberlain and the German foreign minister uh, got, the, uh, they got the Nobel Prize both. And so, and, uh, and so then you come back to uh, uh, what happens during the, uh, the Germans in 1931 during the Depression. They ask if we can have a a free trade agreement with Austria, our Austrian allies. And they go to the League of Nations because they had to get permission. And the British, French, and Czechs veto it. And so the Austrian bank collapses. And the German government, uh, Bruning and the others say, look, if you don't give us some victories, political and diplomatic victories here, 
you're going to get the Nazis. Well, I'll be the last one of them said, I'm going to be the last democratic chancellor of Germany if you allies will not give us any victories, any diplomatic, political, economic victories. And so the Brits uh, wouldn't do it. And so Hitler rises to power. And so Hitler rises to power. And Hitler's, his ideal alliances, as I said, are Britain and they are Italy. And he's a great admirer of, Adel, of um, Il Duce's. And when he was, a, he, was a, he was just the Nazi leader, he wrote to, he wrote to Il Duce through the Italian Chamber of Commerce in uh, Berlin. He said, uh, I'd like an autographed photo of Il Duce. <laughs> and Mussolini wrote across it, denied. <laughs> Mussolini despised Hitler. He thought Hitler was a clown. Hitler made his first foreign trip. He shows up in Venice. As chancellor. As chancellor, 1934. And von Neurath, as foreign minister, says, what you want to do is you want to dress up in civilian clothes. <laughs> He's got this <laughs> silly hat on and this raincoat and this, this other coat and his striped pants and everything. And he shows up and Mussolini is in there in this resplendent outfit. And, uh, and so Mussolini tells Siano and his son-in-law, and the, the, his other diplomats, he says, you know, what a clown this Hitler is. And then Hitler apparently came in and starts talking to him about Mein Kampf. And Mussolini said, you know, he's talking about this book, this stupid book I've never had a chance to read. And then Hitler starts talking about the, the allegedly racial Negroid traits in Mediterranean people like Italians. <laughs> so it was just a horrendous, uh, horrendous meeting. And Mussolini's laughing at this clown. <laughs> so it was just a horrendous, uh, horrendous meeting, and Mussolini's laughing at this clown. But that summer, uh, what happens is the first thing is the uh, is the Hitler uh, conducts the Rome purge of the SA, which was getting had millions, millions of members, and the German army, which was only a hundred thousand strong, or maybe secretly was larger. Uh, the German army tells to Hitler, said, look, you want our support and allegiance, you've got to get rid of this thing, this monstrous SA. It's a rival to the army. And Rome is becoming a counter force. And Rome was uh, Ernst Röhm. He was a homosexual, and he, but he was a war hero. And he wanted a second revolution. In other words, completing the revolution. And he was very much a socialist, very much on the left. And so Hitler uh, decided against Rome was getting too big for his britches. So he flew down there and personally led the... Uh, the purge of Rome where they put him, uh, they caught him all in homosexual trysts and they put him in the penitentiary and they were shooting him left and right. They killed uh, two of them, or they killed, uh, they killed about 200 of the, of the SA leaders. I mean, they were worth, they were a vicious bunch, but at the time the SS took the opportunity to kill a, a former prime minister and his wife and to try to kill Franz von Papen, um, whom they didn't kill. But then what happens here after that is that just stunned Mussolini. He said, these people are complete barbarians. And what happened after that was the coup by local Nazis in Vienna, where local Nazis, probably not with the knowledge of Hitler, people don't know, but walked in and assassinated Dolphus, who was a Catholic conservative, very hardliner, anti-Nazi. They assassinated him, and at that, Mussolini sent four divisions to the, up the Brenner Pass to the Brenner Pass and threatened to intervene if the Germans intervene. And he called the British and French to Stressa, uh, which is on uh, in the northern part of Italy. It's on one of the lakes up there. And he said, we've got to form a Stressa front, Britain, France, and Germany, if the, er, in, in Italy. If the Germans make another move in violation of Versailles, we have to act together and stop them. He was strongly anti-Nazi. He thought Hitler was a, a degenerate, uh, a sexual degenerate, he said. In, uh, and these people are, 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 you know, out of the woods. These are not fascists. These Nazis are a different breed altogether. I mean, we have ideas for the of the Roman, rooted in the Roman past and family and tradition. And these people are a different type. And he was the hardest driving force for an alliance of Britain, France, and Italy to stop uh, Adolf Hitler. So, Pat Buchanan, in your view, how do how do you get from that point to the Mussolini-Hitler alliance? Well, you get the very simple uh, Mussolini. Uh, in the stress of front, the agreement said, we're going to act together against any threat in Europe. And Mussolini put the words in Europe because he had plans then to move into Ethiopia because of an incident on the border where Italians were attacked, I believe, by huge 
massive Ethiopian troops uh, at Wall Wall. And in 1896, the Italians had been defeated at Attawa by the Ethiopian forces. They called it Abyssinia. And the Italian prisoners had been just uh, carved up, just mutilated. It was horrible what was done to them. And Mussolini wanted Ethiopia, or he at least wanted the plains of the Agadam in Ethiopia. And he thought that the British and French, who, after all, had an awful lot of empire, the Brits had all of all of uh, all the way down the way. Oh, you could you could you could walk all the way from from Cairo down to Cape Town without leaving a British imperial territory. Mussolini thought they would smile and let him take Ethiopia. And instead, the British and French are on their high horse, their their League of Nations morality. They impose sanctions on him, and they get the League of Nations to impose sanctions on him. But the sanctions are too weak to drive him out of Ethiopia, but they're strong enough to antagonize and alienate him. And they drove Mussolini straight into the arms of a man he had hated, Adolf Hitler. And out of that came the Pact of Steel and the Hitler-Mussolini, the, the, the Axis. And that was another blunder by the British and French that led directly to World War II. Jonah Goldberg, National Review Online, writes this about your newest book. Mm -hmm. Buchanan claims to be a man of abstract foreign policy rules. Mm -hmm. In his case, the notion that we must act from objective national interest. As a result, he has earned a strange new respect among anti-war liberals, self-described realists for his opposition to the war in Iraq in recent years. He is a man of principle, we've been told. In reality, Buchanan is a wonderful example of how those who claim to follow a strict set of abstract foreign policy rules are often just disguising their own biases. A strict and objective application of our national interest isn't the principle he's upholding. No cold pragmatist he. Buchanan's not following anything here other than the loyalties of his own heart. You mean, I, I don't know what exactly what he's referring to. I'm talking here, basically, about the vital national interest of the British Empire at each point in this process. It seemed to me at Versailles, even though it's very difficult for them at Versailles, given passions that have been aroused by the horrors in the war, to impose a just peace, they should have corrected the errors of Versailles in Britain's own interest, in France's own interest, when they had a democratic Germany. As you move through each of these things, the British should have acted in their own interest and told the Americans, we will break our alliance with Japan if you will give us an alliance. They didn't do that. They broke the alliance with Japan. They caved into the Americans. They capitulated. They appeased the Americans. That was a mistake. With regard to Ethiopia, with regard to Mussolini, this in Kissinger agrees here with me, and everybody else does. Churchill eventually does, and Churchill even did at the time. He said, "I'm I'm very worried about breaking it up with Italy, which has been a longtime friend of ours, over Ethiopia, which is nobody can say that it's a modern nation or an advanced civilized nation. Why are we destroying our relationship with the Italians over this colony?" Uh, over Ethiopia, which we don't care about, when the vital thing is the Germans and we want the alliance with Italy. This is the standpoint of all these decisions is British vital national interest. As I said, the war guarantee was an act of folly because Britain had no vital interest in Eastern Europe, had no interest at all in who controlled Danzig or the corridor, and yet they put the British Empire on the line to go to war on behalf of Poland in a cause in which they disbelieved and in a war they could not win in Eastern Europe, when where they had never fought before. Why in heaven name would you do that? And the answer, of course, is that Chamberlain did it in panic and hysteria. He had been humiliated by Hitler because Czechoslovakia had fallen apart. He'd been made a fool of. And so and, and, and he's being pushed by his foreign, his foreign minister. And he's being pushed by Churchill and Attlee and all the rest. So he makes a stupid decision, which cost Britain their empire. No, I support the, uh, the Americans. As I say, we did it right. Our vital interests, quite frankly, were not in Hungary. And so Ike didn't intervene. Our vital interests weren't in Poland in 1953. They weren't in Czechoslovakia in 1968. We didn't go to war. We just drew a line. We said, don't cross that line, because once you get into Western Germany, you're talking about the vital interest of the United States. We did it right. The British did, a, did it wrong. That is the entire, or one of the entire points of this book. Are all wars unnecessary? Um, no. I mean, the Belgians had no choice in, say, World War I or World War II. They could either fight or lie down. Uh, the uh, American Revolutionary War, 
probably you had to fight to be free of the British Empire. Uh, frankly, the Confederates, if they wanted to be free of the Union, they were going to have to fight Mr. Lincoln's army. So it depends on what your objective is. But an awful lot of wars are unnecessary. The war in Iraq was an unnecessary war. It was a war of choice. We attacked the nation, had not attacked us, did not threaten us, did not want war with us in order to deprive it of weapons it did not have. That is an unnecessary war. When you hear the term isolationist, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you and do you consider yourself to be one? Well, isolationist is a pejorative term. It came into real currency around the time of the Spanish-American War when the, uh, the new imperialists like Theodore Roosevelt and the others, after the Spanish-American War, they wanted to acquire and did acquire Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Hawaiian Islands, and they annexed the Philippine Islands, which turned America in, from a republic into an empire. And a number of anti-war folks, liberals and conservatives alike in that era, uh, said, this is imperialism. This dishonors our founding fathers. Uh, this is taking rule of an alien people whom we have no intention of making American citizens. We are behaving like the other empires of the world. And the people who opposed that were called isolationists. And it was used, frankly, in the 1930s to demonize and smear those like Jack Kennedy, like uh, young Jack Kennedy, young Joe Kennedy, Sergeant Shriver, Gerald Ford, Potter Stewart, who started or supported the America First Committee, which was formed in about April, let's see, April or August of 1940, I believe, and it was designed to keep the United States out of another bloodbath like the First World War, where everything we went to fight for had been lost when the Allies divided up the whole world. I mean, we went fought to make the war safe for democracy. And these young folks, like Jack Kennedy and others, said, we made it safe for the British Empire, which added a million square miles and tens of millions of new subjects. We made it safe for the Japanese Empire. We made it safe for the French Empire. And now we got Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, and Lenin. So how good a war was that? We don't want another one like it. And they were very patriotic people, and they've been smeared ever since. And I mean, they had three presidents, Herbert Hoover, Gerald Ford, and Jack Kennedy, were America firsters. I mean, are they unpatriotic? And so what the idea, but the isolationist term is false in this sense. Those of us who don't want to get in wars that are none of our business, we don't think we ought to be isolated from the world. Neither did Washington and Jefferson and Adams. They thought we should trade with the entire world. They thought we should have as much commercial intercourse as possible, but stay out of any political alliances. Stay out of alliances which can drag us into war. And one of the great achievements, John Adams, of his life was to sever that war, the 1778 treaty with France, which Washington had danced a jig when he got it because he meant they're going to beat the British. But once they won the war, they said, okay, let's get rid of the French. And they were exactly right. We want you guys helping us, and we'll pay you for it. But once it's done, we don't want any part of the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, John Adams, he ended the naval war with France. We were fighting at sea constantly with him. He ended the naval war with France, and they cut a deal. And our, what we got out of it was we severed our treaty with France. And so we stayed out of the Napoleonic Wars until Madison and some of the war hawks, some of the neocons of that day, <laughs> said, look, we can seize Canada. This is great. You know, Wellington's preoccupied here, and the French are going to invade Russia. Let's grab Canada. And so we went into the War of 1812. Now, we had our, we had our motives. The Brits were impressing seamen. They were treating us as they usually treated Cousin Jonathan, with contempt. And the Americans were very bellicose folks in those days. But we went up there to grab Canada, too. We had two, two invasions. Both of them, neither one succeeded. And if it weren't for, frankly, if it weren't for the great Andrew Jackson at New Orleans, the Brits would have torn our country apart. And if it weren't for, frankly, if it weren't for the great Andrew Jackson at New Orleans, the Brits would have torn our country apart. What do you think would have happened if uh, Great Britain had not declared war on Germany on September 1st, 1939? I think the, uh, I don't know what the Poles would have done, whether they would have defied Hitler. Frankly, what the Poles should have done is give him back his, uh, give him back Danzig. It didn't mean that much to the Poles. Let him have his rail and road corridor and, uh, 
and frankly, and ask, uh, and Hitler apparently was willing to compensate with little pieces of land from Slovakia. Uh, and so I think there are a number of things that could have happened. One, there could have been no war at all, not even a German-Polish war. Secondly, if the Poles resisted, Hitler would probably have taken half of Poland uh, and maybe would have gotten into the agreement with Russia. Uh, third, there might have been a German, at that point, that's the only way the German-Russian shared a border was in Poland. You know, they had no border with them, so how are they going to attack them? There could have been a war against Stalin's regime earlier, in which case I think the Germans, even though they weren't as strong, the Germans might have defeated uh, Lenin and hanged the whole crowd in Moscow, and you would have had no Red China, no uh, Gulag Archipelago of its size or duration. Uh, you would have had no Cold War. And see, I don't think Hitler ever wanted to come west. What did he want in France? What did he want? I mean, when he got to France and took it, uh, then they took back Alsace-Lorraine, but he went to Paris for a couple of days. Uh, he went to the Spanish border. He set up his defensive wall there. He didn't demand bases in the Middle East. He didn't demand the French fleet, even though the French and British had demanded the German fleet after World War I. I don't think he wanted anything. What he wanted from the West was, get out of my face. And, and, and this is where I want to be a power in Central and Eastern Europe. This is the German sphere of power and influence. And the British have the world empire and the Americans are predominant in the Western Hemisphere, and the British and the Americans on the seas, and the Japanese in the Far East, we don't care about that, and, but we are dominant here. I think that's what he wanted, sort of a four-power world like that. Who is the worst leader, Hitler or Stalin? Well, I mean, in terms of, of evil, uh, I think it's, I mean, you, it's evil. You can put Mao Tse-Tung in there, Pol Pot. I mean, these people are barbarians. These people deliberately murdered innocent human beings. Hitler in the beginning in the scores and dozens and hundreds, but eventually in the millions. And uh, they fought it. It was a barbaric war between the Germans and the Russians. But Stalin murdered far more, and I think Mao might have murdered far more than he. Uh, but they're all, they're all men who, do believed in, uh, who believed that, that human beings could and should be sacrificed for state aims and aims of power and glory. They're all barbarians. They're all, quite frankly, uh, heretics from uh, the Christian religion. And they imbibe these doctrines, frankly, and they imbibe the doctrines of Darwin, you know, the survival of the fittest and superior races. And there's a great deal of it. You, know, you take any history you read around 1990s, even Americans, you'll find very racist in the sense, you know, the tribe, you know, the Anglo-Saxon superiority and, and the Germans get this Aryan nonsense and, and it was Slavic. Uh, all these, it was very racist in character. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of writing a book on, on all of this, just the power of this, the, the racial aspect of components. And there was a good piece in Foreign Affairs by this fellow who said that the wars of the 20th century in Europe were all, in effect, race wars in the sense that Churchill talked about the Germanic race and the English race, that it was all, they were wars designed to create new countries where that race would be favored and would be, would have its own culture and its own identity separate and unique and, of course, these were the things that broke up the Austro-Hungarian. It was a terrific thesis in foreign affairs, and I've, as I say, I've thought of writing a book on it. Are you familiar with uh, Nicholson Baker's Human Smoke? Oh, yeah, I read Nicholson Baker's Human Smoke. I, I tell you, when I first saw it in the New York Times Review, it, it was a sick feeling in my stomach, and then I got the book and I got sicker because <laughs> I said, he's got 15 or 20 quotes in here that are right out of my book that I haven't seen anybody else use. And I'm saying to myself, you know how parent ignored you, I said, somebody slipped my book to this fellow? But he's the left-wing novelist, and he, he gets some of those wonderful quotes out there. But I, where I disagree with Nicholson Baker is he doesn't put them in context, and there's a moral equivalence between statements, say, anti-Semitic statements by Eleanor Roosevelt and anti-Semitic statements by Goebbels and actions, you know? And, and excuse me, but they're not a parallel. So, but I will say this. It is a, uh, it is a terrific, terrific and provocative book in this sense, that it introduces people to the idea that this was not all white hats and black hats. Uh, and certainly the, the, the German regime was guilty of aggressive war, and the Germans started it when they invaded Poland, and the manifest atrocities of, of, of Hitler are in, unpardonable and inexcusable. But good heavens, look at what Stalin, look at that monster we allied ourselves with. You know, as of September 1, 1939, I figured out Hitler's dead, deliberately you can say from actions he or his regime, Kristallnacht 
and the Rome purge being the two greatest ones. The dead from that were something in the hundreds, probably 300, 400. And I've seen estimates by, uh, by American historians that he probably had 25,000 people in concentration camps like Dachau. At that point in time, Stalin's victims probably numbered 10 million dead, include five to nine million Ukrainians, all the people Lenin was executing left and right, and Trotsky and these animals were executing and starving, and the, the democides, uh, as, as they've been called. And here we ally ourselves with this monster to kill uh, Adolf Hitler. And so, uh, uh, I mean, what was the question? Was it basically which was more evil? <laughs> uh, they're, all, they're all evil. But, you know, then you take a look at some of the things... Uh, you read some of those statements, uh, Curtis LeMay, about bacon and boiling more Japanese in Tokyo in that one night, and uh, then were vaporized and Nagasaki and Hiroshima put together. Yay, and I remember being a little kid cheering that stuff, cheering it on, you know? We used to, at the playgrounds, I hate to say it, we, that's, the, uh, that's what you called kids you didn't like or you got to fight with, you yellow-bellied Jap. That's the language we use. It was in the comic books. It was in the pages. My parents had that Washington Daily News. I saw it in the bottom drawer, and they put it down there, the newspaper that day. Japs bomb Pearl Harbor. It was a, it was very, there were a lot of real racial aspect to that war in the Pacific, and the Japanese gave our folks no quarter, and I think uh, some of our folks reciprocated. Was the Pacific uh, theater a necessary war? Well, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, it was certainly necessary to uh, to retaliate and destroy the Japanese fleet, uh, and a lot else followed from it. Uh, but there's no question about it that uh, after he was reelected safely, FDR, you know, on the statement, uh, mothers and fathers of America, I, I've said it before and I shall say it again and again and again, your sons will not be sent into any foreign wars. I think it's October 30th, 1940. He's reelected. Right away, let's start moving lend lease into Britain. Let's send the American Navy out to chase down German submarines in the Atlantic. Uh, let's cut off oil to Japan when they moved into Indochina, even though FDR knew that uh, that, that would be a cause of war, casus belli. Japanese Prince Kanoya uh, was in power in around August of 19, September 1940, offered to meet FDR anywhere in the Pacific, including Juneau, Alaska, to settle this. Grew, the American ambassador, said, please do it. The Japanese are ready to get out of Indochina. They'd like America to negotiate a settlement in China, where they've been fighting four years. Uh, I think we probably could have, uh, you, could you have avoided the war? Yeah. But the Japanese started it at Pearl Harbor. They did it. They started it and the Americans were saying, let's get the Japanese to fire the first shot. They did and it was a big one. Churchill, Hitler and the unnecessary war, how Britain lost its empire and the West lost the world. Patrick Buchanan's newest book. Thank you for, Mr. Buchanan for allowing us to come here to oh, your home. I'm delighted you came over and I'm delighted with the time because this is a uh, Really, these, these two wars, I think, were the, were the mortal blows that may have killed, uh, may prove the mortal blows of Western civilization. After that, the two wars, of course, killed all the great Western empires that ruled the entire world. America emerged and Bolshevik Russia emerged. Uh, and then the Cold War, we exhausted ourselves. And now you take a look at the European countries. Not a single one of them is, is, uh, has a birth rate that will allow it to survive in present form through this century. Uh, they're being invaded, and they can do nothing, virtually nothing about it from the Islamic world and Africa. It's changing the culture and dividing their societies. And I think it all goes back to these terrible mortal wounds, these physical wounds. It must have killed 150 million civilians, soldiers, the finest of, the, of all these nations, destroyed in battle, and the civilians slaughtered in various ways. Uh, the Christian West committed suicide. And it's lost its faith, and I think it's headed, uh, frankly, I think it's headed on course uh, to Cafe Terminus. We'll leave it there. Next, Book TV visited the Virginia home of Patrick Buchanan, 